Amen. Amen. Well, that's a good start. <clears throat> Today I'm really just going to introduce the, the story of the life of Job, um, a bit of background, and just uh, um, most of you are aware, it's actually quite a long uh, book in the Old Testament, 42 chapters, and it comes in the Bible just before Psalms, but actually one thing I've learned is that it was probably the very first book in the Bible written uh, in early Hebrew. It was still like a poetic book, but it was an autobiography of this man's life, Job. And uh, so it's a story of his life. So really, what we, we're not going to go through every part of every chapter. And we'll be here for a decade, a, a year or two. But we're just going we're gonna, gonna, gonna to look at some of the key points in, uh, in, this, in the story of Job's life. And Job lived some time between, <coughs> we're not exactly sure when he lived, when, when he was on earth, but some time between Noah and the flood and Moses and the Exodus. So that's a pretty broad uh, s- scope of time, probably around the time of Abraham, possibly a little bit before. And so if you think about that in terms of when he was living on earth, it was about 2,000 years before Jesus, about 4,000 years ago approximately, don't know exactly. This guy lived on earth here. And when we think of um, Job and the Bible, you know, what do we think of? I mean, you guys have heard about him. You've heard stories about him probably. What do you think of when you think of the life of Job and the story of, of what happened to him? We think of loss, don't we? We think of uh, sadness. We think of, uh, you know, defeat. We think of a man who suffered and... Uh, And James chapter 5 verse 11 tells us, reminds us of the perseverance of Job. He's a man who went through some really hard stuff that none of us would ever want to deal with in life. But what I've realized as I started looking at this, uh, this autobiography of his life, that what we think of in terms of Job and his life was actually, was only a relatively short season. It was just a short time that he actually went through and came out the other side. But Job's life mostly characterized a life of prosperity and blessing. And when I started to think about that, I thought, well, actually put a little bit of a different perspective on it for me. And I thought, oh, this, this doesn't need to be a negative, depressing time that we're going into now because actually this, he was an awesome man and he had a blessed life and he just went through a, a hard season and came out the other end better and stronger. So it's quite a positive little story, actually, of his life. So today, we're just, as I said, we're going to just open up, look at some of the background, what, do you, what his life was like. And uh, we're going to read today from the beginning in Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, <clears throat> just to get the background picture of what's going on here. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? It's interesting, isn't it? We get a little bit of a picture of things in the heavenly realm that uh, we, we perhaps aren't fully aware of. And Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He, has, he is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. 
Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Have you, you have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Now that's as far as we're going to uh, go really today in terms of the, the, the Bible reading around Job. But the key verse that I want to look at and I want us to think about today, particularly in terms of perhaps ourselves, is this whole concept in verse 10 uh, where God, where the, the devil actually said to God, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Because that's quite an interesting thing to think about, isn't it, when we start to go into this uh, series, into this life of Job. You know, Job had a hedge of protection around his life that made all the difference for him. And, uh, you know, the, the enemy, the devil, wanted to, to destroy him, wanted to bring him down, but actually he couldn't touch him. He couldn't do a thing about him. And uh, he was just prospering away there in the land, and just the, the devil was getting more and more annoyed about it. And so that's why this uh, little discussion came up in heaven. And I want to suggest to you guys that we too can have that hedge of protection around our lives. That's kind of a cool thought, isn't it? That we can actually have that. And the encouraging thing is that it doesn't appear as though Job was anyone particularly special from his background or his past or his family. There's no mention that he had a privileged background or a special family. He may have been a contemporary of Abraham. Quite likely he was a bit before Abraham, but he certainly wasn't a descendant of Abraham. He wasn't under that covenant of blessing that Abraham's family was. And he didn't grow up in Sunday school or church either. He actually was just an ordinary guy out there living his life, and he decided... I'm going to put God first, and I'm going to serve God, and this is the story of what happened to him. So I want to say to you guys, it doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter whether you've grown up in a Christian family. It doesn't matter whether you've been in church all your life, or this is the first time, the first day you've ever stepped into God's house. It doesn't make any difference. You too can come into that place of having a hedge of protection around your life, because that's what... Uh, that's what Job had, and it wasn't because of anything special in his past or his ancestry or anything like that. It's just that he simply chose to live for God, to put him first, and to serve God as best he could in the day that he lived. And the result was a blessed life. Isn't that cool? Any of us can do this. Any of us can experience this regardless of where we've come from. So that's my first encouraging point to you guys today. So how blessed was Job? I mean, let's just think about the, the blessing that this guy actually experienced in his life. <clears throat> We're told he had 7,000 sheep. I mean, for us Kiwis, yeah, it's quite a few, but not that big a deal. There's a lot of there's a lot of stations around the country, especially down the South Island, they've got even more than that. By New Zealand standards, yeah, that's pretty good. But back then, a flock of sheep was a, a small flock that one shepherd would manage, and normally up to about 100 would be quite a big flock. You know, Jesus talked about the, the lost sheep, didn't he? And he talked about the 100, and then, you know, the shepherd lost, lost one, he left the 99 and went. So that was sort of a standard big flock back in the day. But so Job had 70 times more than a normal shepherd would expect to have. So he had quite a big flock. And then he had 3,000 camels. I mean, who would want to have 3,000 camels? <laughs> um, I think, once again, back then, the average family might have had one or two, maybe half a dozen, if they were a big family. And um, uh, camels, I understand, can be milked. So, you know, there's, and they can get a bit of uh, some, the hair off them or something and do different things. But generally, camels were usually used for transport 
and pr transporting produce over long distances. You know, think about the, the wise men. They came from far away. They came on camel. They didn't come on donkeys or uh, a horse and cart or a Lamborghini or anything like that. They came on their camels because that was the best way to travel a long distance and carry goods. And so what it su sort of suggests to me that if, if Job needed 3,000 camels to transport goods long distances, that this guy was a bit of a trader. You know, he had all this wool and he had all these crops and he couldn't just sell them in, in the local community. He had a, a business empire that was stretching probably all over the known world at that time. And his, his uh, teams of camels would go out with all the wool and come back with goods and things from other places that they needed. So he was, he was a bit more than just a farmer. He was a trader. That's what suggests to me the fact that he needed so many camels. The next thing, <coughs> he had 500 yoke of oxen. Now, a yoke of oxen is like a pair. So that's actually a 1,000 oxen that he had. And uh, a pair of oxen, of course, pulled a plow. And apparently, one yoke of oxen, that's two ox with a plow, could plow between one and one and a half acres per day, depending on the soil conditions and so on. So if you work it out that Job had... How many? 500 yoke of oxen. And they were out there and able to plough between one and one and a half acres a day. How many acres a day was Job and his team able to plough? Quite a few. I think my maths isn't that great, but between 500 and 750 acres per day. His men were out there able to plough. That's, that's quite a big cropping operation even in today's world. And if you think about that, if they were plowing away for three weeks, and remember they probably took a day off on the Sabbath, they could potentially plow almost 14,000 acres in three weeks. Quite a big business, quite a big farming operation that Job had happening back then. And then, of course, he had 500 donkeys and donkeys, of course, they were the local transporters just in the local area, delivering goods, delivering staff, taking things out to the fields if they needed seed, if they needed something brought back in at harvest time. Into the, and the donkeys were like the little transporters back in the day. And the camels were the long-term, the long-haul guys. And so um, <coughs> when you start to think, about the scope and the scale of Job's farming and business enterprise, you realise that actually there must have been quite a few people involved in this, mustn't there? It wasn't just one man doing all this by himself. And we, of course we're told that he had many servants, and I, I think maybe there was just many because there was too many to really count or know. And when you think about the fact that every servant and every worker and every manager and every helper that Job had would have had a family around them. And you start to think about the influence that this man would have had in his community. It's huge, isn't it? Now someone, uh, some Bible scholar that I was sort of looking up, one commentator, <coughs> he worked out that because of the way that things were done back in those days, that Job could have actually had about 20,000 people that were directly impacted by his business. It's pretty cold, isn't it? When you think about this, I mean, we don't know exactly, but there would have been thousands and thousands of people, whole community, towns, maybe, maybe uh, even a city that was built around the fact that Job was a prosperous man. <coughs> so there were thousands of people that were dependent and blessed by Job's blessing and prosperity. And we need, to, we need to sort of get our heads around that, that God blesses his people to be a blessing. It wasn't just something for Job's benefit and for his sake. It was the whole community uh, was prospering because of him. Proverbs 14 verse 34 tells us that righteousness exalts a nation. Now, Job's life was lifting up the whole nation, actually, in the Far East there where he lived, the whole area. But sin is a disgrace to any people. That's what the Word of God tells us. <clears throat> then you think about Job's family. 
How many kids did he have? He had 10, 10 kids. He had seven sons and three daughters, the Bible tells us. And I would suspect, we don't know for sure, I would suspect that, that they all lived locally because they used to get together, that they were probably all involved in the family business because back then, in that time, in that culture, that was the expectation that family, that the business would be a family business. You start to think of the, the whole family being involved in that. And then you think about the fact that we're told here that they had frequent get-togethers, celebration parties. They actually chose to get together with each other on special occasions, probably birthdays and things like that. You know, the, the brother, one, uh, one of the brothers would put on a, a party and, and invite his sisters and all his brothers and all their families, and they'd have a, a great big uh, party together. These were, this, this was a family that enjoyed being together. Well, they wouldn't have done that. And they, probably because they worked hard and they celebrated well as well. So it just it gives you a bit of a picture, doesn't it, of the lifestyle of these people. Job had a blessed business, and I think he had a blessed family life as well. It was just, it was just the blessing of God was poured out all around him. And, as well, and besides that, Job had lots of friends too. He wasn't just a loner there by himself. He had his family around him. He had all his, his servants and his helpers, and he would have loved them all, and they would have loved him, and he had friends all over the place. We're going to meet three or four of those friends as we go through this series. And they're people from different families, different tribes with different names. They weren't just the guy next door. Job had a wide influence right across the nation. He was, he was, a, he was an incredible guy. It didn't all just happen by chance. <clears throat> Job was a godly man who became, in verse 3 tells us, the greatest man among all the people of the East. He was a man of great influence for God and for good. So that gives you a bit of a background picture to the life. It's pretty cool, isn't it? When you start to think about you know, what sort of a guy he must have been. <clears throat> Satan, the devil, looked at Job's life. He looked at his prosperity. He looked at his good influence. He looked at how it was actually raising the whole nation. That whole area was just prospering and God-honoring. and Just because of one man's faith. It's incredible, isn't it? And he wanted to destroy it because that's his nature. He wanted to create havoc and bring the whole thing down. John chapter 10, verse 10, I'm sure you're familiar with this, uh, but it reminds us, just as Jesus speaking, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. We don't ever think, I mean, as we get into this, we're going to realize the, real, the true nature and identity of, of Satan. And what, Don't ever think you can be mates with the devil and you know, put on a Halloween mask and it's all fun and, and have seances and all that sort of thing because it's not fun. We're actually dealing with the real devil, the real enemy, who's not actually ever going to be our friend. He wants to pull us down. He wants to create havoc. He wants to destroy the good influence that you and I are seeking to have in this community and in our families. And that's exactly what he wanted to do to Job. <coughs> we'll look at that a bit more as the weeks go by. But remember the second part of that verse, but Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. Isn't that a complete opposite spirit? You know, there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no common ground between the devil and God, between Satan and Jesus. It's just, it's just uh, chalk and cheese, complete opposites. But the reality is that the devil couldn't touch Job or his family or his livestock or his business enterprise or his servants or the community he was a part of. Why? Because God had a hedge of protection around Job and everything that he did. And that's so cool. <clears throat> and because we can have that too. In fact, I think we have many advantages over Job because we've got so much more information about how we can do this. Now, Job was back there. You think about it. He was back there living in a time before the Bible was even written. He didn't have the Word of God. It hadn't been written yet. He wrote the first, or someone on his behalf wrote the first uh, book. 
<coughs> and uh, see, Genesis hadn't even been written because Moses wrote that, and he was before Moses, so that none of the Bible was available to him. And uh, of course, Job may have understood the principles in the Word of God, and he may have, and he may have practiced them, or he may have just done what he could. And I think it shows the grace of God that it's not actually about being Mr. and Mrs. Perfect. It's actually about our heart. And when the Word of God says that Job was blameless, he didn't say, God didn't say that Job was sinless. He said he was blameless. He's one of those guys that actually, as he goes through life, he made a few mistakes, but he put them right. And he understood the thing about sacrifice and uh, he was forgiven. And, you know, we don't even know whether Job, for example, understood the principle of tithing. Let's, you see, in the Word of God, all the way through, God gives us little hints and He gives us little ideas of how we can be blessed and how we can have a hedge of protection around our lives. One of those little hints, one of those little opportunities that we have to be blessed is to understand the principle of, principle of tithing. And uh, we don't know whether, but it also, we can be sure that Job was generous. And I'll tell you why. And we might just quickly read this in <coughs> Job chapter 29, verses 11 to 13. <coughs> Job, in his defense, this is a bit later on, this is what he says about him, himself. Whoever heard me spoke well of me. And those who saw me commended me because I rescued the poor. This is the sort of man he was who cried for help. And the fatherless, who had no one to assist him. Job was there to help them. The man who was dying blessed me. When people were in a time of absolute need, who would show up with some resources and some food and some blessing? Be Job. I made the widow's heart sing. You know, a woman who was on her own, with no help and no support, and who would be there? Job. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind. That means he'd see a blind man and he'd help him see the way. And feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. And I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. And man, there's just so much more about the sort of life in there that the person that Job was, just incredible. He was a generous, good man. He, his riches wasn't about himself. And we'll cover that as well as we go through. He says that gold and all that stuff is great, but it's not what my life's about. That's what he says in chapter 31. It was a result of his life, not the goal of his life. And there's a huge difference there. But if you think about the principles that we understand through the Word of God, tithing, he didn't have the teaching that we've got from Malachi 3 verse 6. We all know it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Pretty, pretty good hint from God there about how we can have a hedge and blessing around our business. You know, <clears throat> God really does want to pour out his blessing on us. And he just gives us these little nudges, these little hints all the way through his word. And sometimes we read them and we come up with all the excuses under the sun. Why, actually, that's in the Old Testament. Yeah, but Jesus commended those who tithed. And actually, it's in the law. Oh, yes, but actually, Abraham tithed before the law. So, you know, it's, you know, we can have all the excuses under the sun. And then the problem is that we miss out. And God's just saying, come on, guys. I've given you hints on how to do this. And that's one of them. It's not the only one. Uh, <clears throat> that's why he tells us over and over in his word how to live and how to give. And, and tithing, of course, it's not just about giving God the leftovers. It's about, there's a principle there of first fruits, of giving God the first and your best. Don't just give him the old crook cow. Give him the best one. Or don't wait until you've got 10 bucks left in your bank. Oh, yeah, I can tithe now. No, tithe in faith at the beginning. 
before, and then there's an element of faith, there's an element of trust, there's an element of honor to God that actually catches God's heart. And you say, oh, I'm going to put a hedge of protection around this guy's business. I'm going to bless him because I love his heart. That's what it's all about. It's not about the money. It's not about God needing our money. It's about God wanting our heart. And there's a huge difference there. <clears throat> Give to others. Luke 6, verse 38. In the New Testament, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together. There's a principle there. If we're generous in giving, we will receive. It's just the principle of life. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Here's another one. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. It's a key for blessing. I mean, don't marry an unbeliever, for example, and don't go into business with an unbeliever either. Because remember the hedge. You, know, you want the hedge around your life, don't you? And an unbeliever does not have a hedge. And if you're in business with someone that hasn't got a hedge around their life and you're wanting it, but guess what? The devil can get in and he can destroy, he can take, he can steal from your business because there's no hedge. So don't go into business with an unbeliever. Actually, partnerships, you know, partnerships, it's an, usually, I think, people go into partnerships because they're wanting to make lots of money and they haven't got enough to invest of their own. And so they're trying to use someone else's capital and someone else's stuff. So they, it's, it's, a, it's a trap. Just put that out there. <coughs> and also... God reminds us to bless God's people, Israel, doesn't he? Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. God promised that I will bless those who bless you. That's when you're speaking to Abraham and curse those who curse you. Just be careful how we speak about God's people, Israel. You know, I know we can get up in all, in, caught up in all sorts of political st stuff about the Palestinians and we meet a Jew and he's not that nice or something. But actually... Yeah, we can, can't we? We can get caught up in the pettiness of all, but just go back to God's word. It's a nudge. It's a hint from God. If you want a hedge, if you want a blessing, just bless my people. Another one is, you know, don't judge. Another hint from God. If we want, if we want to be free from judgment, don't go judging everyone else because it, it pulls down the hedge and we can be open to uh, accusations ourselves. <coughs> Job didn't have the Ten Commandments to live by because they weren't written yet. Or the temple to worship in because the temple wasn't built because Solomon wasn't even born when Job was alive on earth. And yet Job still worshipped God and he lived with integrity. See, we don't need necessarily to have all the laws and all the rules and the place we can still worship God can't we? Wherever we are, and we can still live with integrity, no matter whether we even know exactly what that might look like. We can just do our best. And we live in an era of grace. We are so, we've got so many opportunities over, over Job. We live in a time of grace. We can have forgiveness and salvation through Jesus and what he did on the cross. Marie reminded us through that reading this morning. And you know, Job lived 2,000 years before Jesus. Incredible. And yet, he still understood the principle of sacrifice and forgiveness. That's why, after his family had had a, a bit of a, a celebration, he would sacrifice on their behalf. Not because they were huge sinners, but just in case one of them had said something or upset someone or judged someone or hadn't been as generous or, you know, had too much to drink or whatever. Now, he, 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 knew, he understood the principle of sacrifice and salvation 2,000 years before Jesus was on earth. Incredible. And he hadn't received the gift of the Holy Spirit or been a part of the church that we can be, that Jesus is building, because it didn't exist back then. It only existed in the eyes of the prophets and the, the hearts of people probably like Job. But I can guarantee to you that if Job had been here today, he would have been all in. 
with what God's doing, wouldn't he? I think he would have been quick to give his life to Jesus at an altar call. I think when when there was a mention of baptism, he'd be putting his hand up, I want to do that. When there was an opportunity to be prayed for, to receive the Holy Spirit, Job would have been the first in line. He would have been praying, reading God's word. He would have been out on the team wherever he could. He'd be serving and helping. He'd be sowing into the vision because he had a lot of wealth, remember? And he would have been worshiping when the when it was worship time. I think I don't think he would have been sitting uh, in the back row with his arms folded and looking grumpy during the worship. I think he would have been really getting into it, wouldn't he? No offense, back rows, guys. Someone had to sit there. Bless you for doing that. And I know you would have been really getting into it today. But just, I mean, just think about it. I mean, I'm using a bit of license here. We've got to think about this guy. What would he have really been like if he was here today? I mean, God said he was blameless and upright in every way. And he just loved God and wanted to put God first. If you had that heart and that spirit, you wouldn't be holding back, would you? You'd be in there. He'd be, you, he would have been excited about God's house and the mission for reaching the lost, for missions. He would have been on the team or sowing into the team. It was off to Cambodia. He would have been helping at the food bank, helping the needy, helping the poor, wanting to just do whatever he could to fulfill the mission. And when God looked at Job's life, that's why he said, he is a man I can trust with blessing. He is a man I can trust. His eye is not on the riches. His eye is on me and other people. That's what God was saying. I can trust this guy. And I'm going to put a hedge of protection around him that is impenetrable to the enemy. Because I love him. And God loves that spirit and that heart, doesn't he? He just loves it. Catches his attention. I want you to think about the fact that um, it didn't matter what Job did, he would have been blessed. Because we think of him, you know, he's, he's a farmer, and we think, well, I'm not a farmer. And you think, well, you know, it doesn't apply to me, all this. But I want to suggest to you guys that whatever line of work or life Job chose, he would have been blessed. Just imagine if Job was a school teacher, for example, and he had a hedge around him, and every day he was responsible for a class full of, what sort of a teacher would he have been? He would have been such an awesome teacher. I don't know about you guys, but I can remember one or two teachers that I had when I was at school that actually shaped the future of my life. That's what teachers can do. That's what a teacher with the hedge of God around them can do. What if Job was a doctor or a nurse? He would have been a pretty awesome doctor, wouldn't he? He would have diagnosed things. He, people would have left his surgery with hope that they're going to get better. What if Job was a beekeeper? Would have been camel loads of manuka honey, the best in the world, going off to faraway nations and bringing back all sorts of treasures. What if Job was a roofer? There wouldn't have been too many leaky roofs in Job's area of responsibility. I mean, we can, we can go on, can't we? What if Job was a horticulturalist? He just loved growing plants and things. Well, he probably did. He was a farmer. He had lots of crops anyway. But, you know, we've got... Uh, got horticulturalists in the church. He would have had just flourishing plants. He would have had a, a line of people wanting to buy his produce and get his plants and put them in the garden because they'd grow better. And if, if Job was an artist, he wouldn't have been a businessman, would he, if he was an artist? He would have been painting all sorts of amazing paintings and Lisa, I hear you sold a painting for a couple of thousand dollars the other week. Just under a couple of thousand. Pretty cool. We've got Miranda. She's probably got that art thing happening at her place today. You know, God, God gifts us all differently. 
We're not all supposed to be the same. God wants us to, to work and live in our gifts and our passions, and he wants to bless that. He wants to multiply. If, 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 if Job was a builder, you know what awesome houses he would have built. There'd be no leaky, shoddy building. He would have probably had a building company that would have just spread all over the nation with the best reputation. What if Job was a farmer? Oh, that's right, he was. What if Job was a family man? He just would have been blessed with his sheep and his camels and his kids. And it's cool, isn't it, to think about that? That's what happens when we've got a hedge of protection around our life. We have the favor of God and, and, and we have the blessing and the prosperity and the, and, the, and the grace of God just flowing. And that's what God wants for us. That's why he gives us all these hints all through the Bible of how to live and how to be and how to, how to be like that and to experience that. The devil looked at Job and said to God, he only serves you for what he can get. Look at all those possessions and wealth that you've given him. But God looked at Job and he said two times, twice in verse 1 and verse 8, he, Job is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. As I said before, God said about Job, I can trust him with blessing. And he built that impenetrable hedge. And if he can trust you and me, He'll do the same for us. That's what the Word of God, that's what the life of Job actually can, can teach us. There's no reason why you or I or any of us can't flow and live in the same sort of blessing that Job did. With our families, with our marriages, with our work, our businesses, whatever it is. That's the introduction to this series today, guys. I hope there's been some encouragement to you. Next week, as we move through this book of Job, we're, we're going to see that, Job, that God can actually trust Job with even more, even more than all that he'd given him. God could trust Job with heaps more. And as, as God takes Job through stuff, he also takes him deeper and further than he's ever been. This is an exciting book. We're going to dig into it more as the weeks go on. So you might like to start reading ahead and get a, get a bit of a heart and a feeling for what, uh, what where we're heading with this. So anyway, bless you guys. Uh, how about if we stand? Let's get ready to... Uh, let's get ready to worship God and just really praise Him this morning. He's an awesome, awesome Heavenly Father that just wants to bless us.